Hello, welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara. Lily's back there, Jamie's under the bed. And today, I want to introduce you to somebody new. And she's, we just got her at the Humane Society. Her name is Clove, and she's a Himalayan. And she's doing very well. Uh, she's the first cat I've ever had that just made in very well with our other kitties. And she just came in like she owned the place. And now she's chilling out on her daddy's side of the bed. <laughs> Oh, and here's Jamie. She came up. All three kitties together. Well, isn't that nice? But anyway, as always, I want to remind you to please stay safe and healthy. Hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. Today, we are going to get back to Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. Les Mis. Hopefully, I don't think. <laughs> well, there they go. This is good. This is, they're getting to know each other. So... We are on St. Vic, uh, St. Dennis and Idol of the Rue Plumet. We are on the book, so on book 10, I believe it is. I can't remember the name of that one. I think it's like June something, 1830, June 5th, 1832. Subcategory 4, Outbursts of Former Times. And I'm going to try to read this whole, today, I mean today we're not going to get two books done because I spent the day getting her. Outbursts of former times. Nothing is more extraordinary than the first swarming of a riot. Everything bursts out, everything, everywhere all at once. Was it foreseen? Yes. Was it prepared? No. Where does it spring from? From the pavements. Where does it fall from? From the clouds. Here the insurrection has the characteristics of a plot. There of an improvisation. The first comer takes possession of a current in the multitude and leads it wherever it wa he wants, a beginning full of terror, mingled with a sort of frightful gaiety. At first there is shouting, the shops close, the displays of the merchants disappear, then some isolated shots, people flee, gun but butts struck, strike against carriage doors. You hear the serving girls laughing in the yards of the houses and saying, there, there's going to be a real ruckus. Before a quarter of an hour had elapsed, here is what had taken place at practically the same time at 20 different points in Paris. <clears throat> in the Rue Saint Croix de la, de la Bretonnere, some 20 young men with beards and long hair entered a smoking room and came out again a moment later, bearing a horizontal tricolored flag covered with crepe and having at their had three armed men, one with a sword, another with a gun, and the third with a pike. In the Rue des Nones de Harris, a well dressed, pot bellied bourgeois with a ringing voice, a bald head, a high forehead, a sweetheart, a black beard, and one of those rough mustaches that cannot be smoothed down, publicly offered cartridges to passerby. In the Rue Saint Pierre Montmartre, some men with both with bare arms paraded a black flag in which these words could be read in white letters, Republic or Death. In the Rue des Juniers, the Rue de Cadran, the Rue Motor Jewel, and the Rue Mandar groups appeared at waving flags on which the word section with a number could be seen in gold letters. One of these flags was red and blue with an imperceptible white stripe between. An arms factory was plundered on the boulevard St. Martin, as were three armors, armorer's shops. The first in the Rue Beauberg, the second in the Rue Michael Le Comte de, the third in the Rue the Temple. In a few minutes, the thousand hands of the multitude seized and carried off 230 muskets, nearly all double-barreled, 64 swords, 83 pistols, to arm more people, one took the gun, another the bayonet. Opposite the Quay de, de la Grave, young men armed with muskets installed themselves in a woman's apartment to shoot. One of them had a musket with a match lock. They rang, entered, and set to make cartridges. One of these women, women said, I did not know what cartridges were. My husband told me to. A throng broke into a junk shop in the Rue des Vielles. Hadriats and took some Yadajans and Turkish arms. The corpse of a mason killed by a musket shot 
was lying in the Rue de la Perlée, and then right back, left bank on the quays on the boulevards in the Latin Quarter in the market area. Breathless men, working men, students, section chiefs, red proclamations, cried to arms, broke the street lamps. Unharnessed wagons tore up the pavement, smashed in house doors, uprooted the trees, ransacked the cellars, rolled kegs, heaped up paving stones, pebbles, pieces of furniture, boards, made barricades. They forced the bourgeois to help them. They went into the women's houses. They made them give up their absent husband's sword and gun and wrote over the door in white. Weapons surrendered, some signed with their names, receipts for the gun and sword, and said, send for them tomorrow to the Mary. They disarmed the solitary sentinels in the streets and national guards going to their assignments. They tore off the officers' epaulettes in the Rue du Cimetière, St. Nicholas, an officer of the National Guard, pursued by a troop armed with clubs and boils, took refuge with great difficulty in a house he was able to leave only at night in a disguise. In the quarter St. Jacques, the students came out of their houses in swarms and went up the Rue St. Hyacinth to the Café du Progrès or down to the Café de Sept Billiards on the Rue des Athurins, there in front of the doors, some young men standing on the posts distributed arms. They pillaged the lumberyard on the Rue Transnone to make barricades. At a single location, the inhabitants resisted at the corner of the Rue saint avoy and Simon Lefranc, where they destroyed the barricade themselves. At a single location, the insurgents gave way. They abandoned a barricade begun on the Rue du Temple after having fired on a detachment of the National Guard and fled the through the Rue de la Cordere in the barricade. The detachment picked up a red flag, a package of cartridges, and 300 pistol balls. The National Guards tore up the flag and carried the shreds on the point of their bayonets. Everything we are relating here slowly and successfully took place simultaneously in all parts of the city in the midst of the vast tumult, like a myriad of flashes and a single peal of thunder. In less than an hour, 27 barricades arose from the ground in the market quarter. At the center was that famous house, No. 50, which was the fortress of Jean and his 106 companions, and which flanked on one side by, by a barricade at St. Mary and on the other by a barricade on the Rue Mauvy, commanded three streets, the Rue des Arcis, the Rue St. Martin, and the Rue Aubrey la Butcher, on which it, is, it fronted. Two barricades at right angles ran back, one from the Rue Montejuel to the Grand Turanderie, the other from the Rue Geoffrey Langevin to the Rue St. Avoy, without counting innumerable barricades in 20 other quarters of Paris. In the Marais at Mount St. Genevieve, there was one on the Rue Manila Mont tent feature a carriage above the torn off its door, torn off its hinges. Another near the little bridge of the Hotel Dieu, made with a small carriage, unhitched and overturned within 300 yards of the pref prefecture police. At the barricade on the Rue des Manetries, a well dressed man distributed money to the laborers. At the barricade on the Rue Grenatat, a horseman appeared and handed to the one who seemed to be the leader of the barricade, a roll that looked like a roll of money. This, said he, is to pay the expenses, wine, etc. A young man of fair complexion, without a tie, went from one barricade to another, carrying orders, another withdrawn a sword, a blue police cap on his head, was stationing sentinels. Within the barricades, wine shops and porters, lodges were conver converted into guardhouses. Moreover, the uprising, the uprising was conducted according to the soundest military tactics. The narrow, uneven, sinuous streets full of turns and corners were admirably ch chosen. The area near Les Halleys in particular, so a network of streets more inter intricate than the forest. The Society of the Friends of the People, so it was said, 
had assumed the direction of the insurrection in the quart Quartier saint Avoy. A man killed in Rue du Ponce, who was searched, had a map of Paris on him. What had really assumed the direction of the Emute was a sort of unknown impetuously impetuous impetuosity in, in the atmosphere. The insurrection had abruptly built the barricades with one hand and with the other seized nearly all the posts of the garrison. In less than three hours, like a, tri a trial of, like a trail of powder catching fire, the insurgents had invaded and occupied on the right bank of the, ar the arsenal, arsenal, the mayor's office of the, of the Place Royale, all the marais, the Popincourt Arms Factory, the Galliot, the Chateau d'U, all of the streets near the markets on the left bank, the barracks of the veteran St. Pelagi, the place Mobert, the, pow the powder mills of the Du Moulins, all the city gates. At five in the afternoon, they were masters of the Bastille, the lingerie, the Blanc's Manteau. The scouts touched the place des victories and thre threatened them. the bank, the barracks of the Petit Paris, and the Hotel des Postes, the third of Paris, was involved. At all points, the struggle had begun on a gigantic scale, and from the disarmings, from from the domiciliary visits, from the armories, armorers' shops, hastily invaded. There was the result that the that the combat began begun by throwing stones was continued by rifle fire. Around six in the evening, the arcade of Du Salmon became a battlefield. The rioters were at one end, the troops at the opposite. They had fired. They fired from one gate to the other. One observer, a dreamer, the author of this book, who had gone to get a close view of the volcano, found himself caught in the arcade between the two fires. He had nothing but the protection of the pilasters that separate the shops to protect him from the bullets. He spent close to an hour in this delicate situation. Meanwhile, the drums beat the long roll. The National Guards hurriedly dressed and armed themselves. The legions left the town halls. The regiments left their barracks. Opposite the arcade de la Ancre, a drummer was struck by a dagger. Another on the Rue du Signy was assailed by some thirty young men who destroyed his drum and took away his sword. Another was killed in the Rue Gren Grenier, Saint Lazare. In the room, Michael Leconte, three officers fell dead on one after another. Several municipal guards wounded in the Rue des Lombards turned back. In front of the Corps Batav, a detachment of National Guards found a red flag bearing this inscription, Republican Revolution Number 127. Was it a revolution? In fact, as you can say back then, I mean, at one time, the Republicans were more, more of a liberal bu bunch, whether this was France or whether it was America. They try to confuse you nowadays, but even the Republicans of America were more... Uh, Progressive. I don't like to use the word liberal. Progressive is a better word because I'm not really liberal myself. But I am, I am for progress and justice and prog progression. So, but like I said, it's it's so perverted nowadays that none of them are really any good. So, it's all very very perverted. <coughs> In front of the Corps Batav attachment of the National. Guards found a red, red flag bearing this inscription, Republican, Re okay, I read that. The insurrection had made the center of Paris a sort of inextricable, torturous, torturous colossal city. And that thing, like I said, you know, they have people confused, you know, you got people defending the super rich, and, and it's almost like, the, you know, we got this pandemic going on. And they don't want to see people have been put out to work that they're they're upset because they're getting a little extra money the people that are out of work I mean it's just gross that to me fellow Americans would feel that way you know it's just disgusting and then you have the, the government that that gets most of the years uh, is vacation time and they get all this money and it's just you know can't people think I, I don't know I just I just I don't understand their thinking I, I don't and don't get me wrong I'm not for people being lazy either I'm really not 
I just, I don't know. I don't get it. There was the focus. They are the clear center of combat. All the rest were only skirmishes. What proved that all would be decided? Decided there was that they were not yet fighting. In some regiments, the soldiers were hesitant, which added to the frightening obscurity of the crisis. They remember the popular ovation, which in July 1830 had greeted the neutrality of the 53rd of the line. Two intrepid men who have been proven by the great wars. Marshal de Lobat and General Bugo were in command. Bugo under Lobat, enormous patrols composed the battalions of the line surrounded by entire companions of the National Guard and preceded by a commission of police with his badge went out reconnoitering the insurgent streets. On their side, the insurgents placed pickets at the street corners and boldly set, sent patrols outside the barricades. They kept watch on both sides. The government, with an army in its hand, hesitated. Night was c coming on, and the toxin of St. Mary began to be heard. The Minister of War of the time, Marshal Soult, even Austerlitz, observed this with gloomy countenance. These old hands accustomed to correct maneuvering and having no resource or guide except tactics. That com compass of battles are completely lost in the presence of, the va of that vast foam called the wrath, wrath of the people. The wind of revolution is not tractable. The National Guard of the suburbs hurried together in, in disorder. A battalion of the 12th Light ran down from St. Denis. The 14th of the line arrived from Corbevoy. The batteries of the military school had taken up position at the carousel. Art artillery came from Vincennes. Solitude reigned at the Tuileries. Louis, Louis Felipe was full of serenity. Subcategory 5, and we're almost at the end of this book. Originality of Paris. For two years, as we have said, Paris has been seen more than on one insurrection. Outside of the in insurgent quarters, nothing is usually more strangely calm than the physiognomy of Paris during an uprising. Paris grows accustomed to everything very quickly. It's only in a mute, and Paris is so busy that it does not get worked up over such a trifle. These colossal cities alone can contain such spectacles. These immense pre precincts alone can contain, at the same time, a civil war and an indescribable eerie tranquility. Usually when the insurrection begins, when the drum, the long roll, the call to arms are heard, don't worry about it. The shopkeeper merely says, It seems there's some squabble on the Rue Saint Martin or Faubourg Saint Antoine. Often he adds coolly, Somewhere down that way. Afterward, when he distinguishes the dismal and harrowing <clears throat> uproar of musketry and the platoons firing, the shopkeeper says, So it's warming up. Well, now it's really warming up. A moment later, if the uprising approaches and swells, he precipitously, he precipitately, Precipitately shuts up his shop and hastily dons his uniform, which is to say, <coughs> excuse me, and places his goods in safety and risks his person. They fired each other on the street corners in an arcade in a cul de sac. Barricades are taken, lost, retaken, blood flows, the front of, front of the houses are riddled with grape shot, bullets kill people in their beds. Corpses litter the pavement. A few streets away you hear the clicking of billiard balls in the cafes. The theaters open their doors and play comedies. The curious chat and laugh two steps from these, step, these streets full of war. The fiacres jog along. Passerby are going to dine in the city. Sometimes in the very area where there is fighting. In 1831 a fu fusillade was supposed suspended to let a wedding party passed by. During the insurrection of the 12th of May, 1839, in the Rue St. Martin, a sickly little old man pulling a handcart topped by a tricolored rag, in which there was a decanter filled with some liquid, went back and forth from the barricade to the troops. Hey, stop it. Lily, leave her alone. That wasn't nice. Oh, poor little thing. That wasn't nice, Lily. 
Okay, barricade offering glasses of Coke. That was mean. During the insurrection of the 12th of May, 1839, in the Rue St. Martin, a sickly little old man pulling a hand cart topped by a tricolored rag in which there were decanters filled with some liquid went back and forth from the barricade to the troops and the troops to the... Don't worry, I'll let you out in a minute, baby. To the barricade, offering glasses of cocoa impartially. Now to government, now to anarchy. <laughs> I guess the anarchy's happening. Hold on, I'll be right back. I'm going to let her out. Okay, sorry. That's what happens when you get a new kitty. Okay, nothing is stranger, and this is the peculiar property of the Paris riots, not found in any other capital. Two things are needed for it. The greatness of, the pa of Paris and its gaiety. It requires the city of Voltaire and a Napoleon. You good girl. This time, however, in the armed contest of the 5th of June, 1832, the great city felt something that was perhaps stronger than herself. She was afraid everywhere. In the most distant and the most disinterested quarters, you saw doors, windows, and shutters closed in broad daylight. The courageous were armed. The cowards hid. The careless and busy wayfarer disappeared. Many streets were as empty as at four in the morning. Alarming stories went the rounds. Ominous rumors were spread that they had taken the bank, that they, that merely at the cloisters of St. Mary, there were 600 entrenched and fortified in the church, that the line was doubtful, that Armand Carroll had been to see Marshal Clausel, and that the Marshal had said, have one regiment in first place, that Lafayette was sick, but that he said to them, I am with you, I will follow you anywhere, that there is room for a chair, that it was necessary to keep on their guard, that at night people would pillage the isolated houses in the deserted neighborhoods of Paris. The imagination of the police was recognized here that Anne Radcliffe, element in government, that a battery had been set up in the Rue Aubrey Le Boucher. I'll be there in a sec. That Lebeau and Bougaud were conferring, and that at midnight or daybreak at the latest, four columns would march at once on the center of the emute. The first coming from the Bastille the second from the Port St. Martin, the third from La Grave, La Grieve, actually, the fourth from Les Halles, that perhaps the troops would evacuate Paris and fall back on the Champ de Mars, that nobody knew what might happen, but that certainly this time it was serious. They were concerned about Marshal Soult's hesitation. Why doesn't he attack right away? It is certain he was deeply absorbed. The old lion seemed to scent in that darkness some unknown monster. Evening came on. The theaters did not open. The patrols made their rounds. Spitefully, pedestrians were searched. The suspicious were arrested. At nine, there were more than 800 persons under arrest. The prefecture of police were crowded. The concierge were, was crowded. The force was crowded. At the concierge in particular, the long vault called the Rue de Paris was strewn with bun bundles of straw in which lay a throng of prisoners rang valiantly by the man of lions, Lagrange. The rustling of all the straw stirred by all these men was like the sound of a downpour. Elsewhere, on the prisoners lay in the open air in the prison yards, piled on one top of another, one on top of another. Anxiety was widespread. A certain nervousness little known to Paris. People barricaded themselves in their houses. Wives and mothers were terrified. You heard only this. Oh, my God, he hasn't come home. One scarcely heard even a distant rumbling of a wagon on their doorsteps. People listened in to the rumors, the cries, the tumult, the faint, and indistinct sounds, things that prompted them to say, That's the cavalry, or those are the ammunition wagons galloping in, the trumpets, the drums, the musket fire, and above all, that mournful tocsin of St. Mary. They waited for the first cannon shot. Armed men appeared at the at the street corners and disappeared, crying, Go home, and people hastened to bolt their doors. They said, How will it turn out? Progressively night fell. Paris seemed more and more ominously lit by the stupendous flame, stupendous flame of the uprising. And in the next video, we're going to get into Book 11, The Adam Fraternizes with the Hurricane. Let's see how many, how long that is. I'm not going to read any of it today, but... That's a very short book. It uh, goes from 169 to 
It's a very short book. Probably could read it today, but to 181, so it's like 11 pages, and then we're into core. So we're in there. See how long that one is. Mm -hmm. That one's fairly long, but there's one whole page of uh, French, but it, 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 it translates over here. Wow, there's a couple right back here, yeah, okay. There you go, okay. Then we'll be on book 13, okay. But if you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below notification bell and I want you to stay safe and healthy and come back be sure to join me our new kitty Clove when she comes back and Lily stops hissing Jamie the sweetheart here and our sweetheart Lily they're doing good though pretty good you have a great day like I said stay safe and healthy thank you